Well, what does the national media think this LSU football team's ceiling and floor is? And how do we feel about the national media's evaluation of this LSU football team? You are Locked On LSU, your daily podcast on the LSU Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, thank you for making Locked in LSU your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Also, just a reminder, we're also on YouTube as well. So you can listen to your preferred podcast platform, of course, as you always can. You can also watch the podcast on YouTube. My name is Caroline Fenton, and I am your host, as I am every single day. You can follow me on Twitter at Caroline Fenton one You can also follow along for the podcast for updates at Locked on LSU. Well, as of tomorrow, Saturday, we are just one week away from SEC football. When Vanderbilt hosts hosts Hawaii in week zero, I'm pumped. I'm ready for it. It's finally feeling like football is actually on the horizon after months of talking about NIL and conference realignment and what are the expectations of this team and can Brian Kelly do it in year two and celebrating a couple of national championships along the way. We're finally almost there. So hold on. You can do it just a little bit longer. You've been so patient. Just be patient just a little bit longer because we are almost there. But as I always like to say, we're almost there, but we're not quite there. So of course we are still in the middle of of talking season. So in the you know celebration of talking season, I've done my talking, you've done your talking, we've all done our talking, but let's break down the national media's talking about the ceiling and the floor for this LSU football team because on espn.com they pulled, you know, a bunch of staff writers at ESPN, you know, on-air people, writers, radio, TV, college football people at ESPN, and they all kind of pulled together the best and worst case scenario for each team in the top 25. Now, remember in the AP poll, LSU is number five, which first of all, shouts out top five, Brian Kelly in uh, in his second season. Like I said, AP poll preseason doesn't matter. The one that matters is in January, but you know, you don't really get a trophy for being preseason top 25, but, you know, do with that information what you will. So the best case scenario, at least according to ESPN.com, best case scenario for LSU, the college football playoff semifinal. It says nobody saw LSU getting to the SEC championship game a year ago, especially after getting pummeled by Tennessee 40 to 13 at home. Second week of October, we don't need to bring that one up. We all remember what happened. Uh, it says, but the Tigers picked themselves up off the turf, kept getting better, and Brian Kelly squeezed everything and then some out of his first LSU team. His second team will be even deeper, ideally. I mean, that's what we can all hope. Article continues to say that Kelly knows more about this team, and most importantly, the Tigers have a seasoned quarterback in Jaden Daniels, who has proven on big stages that he can beat teams both passing and running. If LSU can manage to get through this month of September unscathed, most notably the Florida State game, and that November 4th game at Alabama could end up being a play-in game for the playoff. I agree. Honestly, I, I agree. And a lot of times when I read these national articles, whether it's ESPN.com or The Athletic or CBS Sports or on 3 or 24-7 Sports, whatever it may be, I generally, for the most part, disagree with either portions of it or the entirety. Just because I feel like there are always details that are missed, maybe from the national perspective, to be expected. That's no knock on the work that the national writers and, and you know, college football people do. It's just you simply cannot get into the weeds of 130 teams like maybe I can on this podcast with just LSU. Or sometimes I feel like there are certain benefits, benefits of the doubt either given or not given on the national Stage Like, I think, you know, Alabama being AP poll preseason number four overall is 
a big benefit of the doubt coming off of a 10 and two season and coming into a season where there are a whole lot of questions with this Alabama team. I think that fourth overall ranking is a benefit of the doubt to Nick Saban in this Alabama program more so than it is maybe credit to this team and what they, they could possibly do. So I was surprised when I agreed because that is this team's best case scenario. I think a 12 and 0 season is this team's ceiling. Now I read, I believe it was in the athletic that wrote that LSU's ceiling is 10 and two. I can't agree with that. Maybe that's a react, like a realistic ceiling, a realistic best case scenario. But when we're talking ceiling, we are talking about the absolute best that this team can achieve. So I guess you could say, well, yeah, I guess 12 and 0 is the best case scenario for, for every team. So we do have to have a little bit, bit of reality set into that. Like Auburn's best case scenario is not 12 and 0 because that's just not realistic. The best case scenario for this team is that you go undefeated throughout the regular season. You win the West, you go to the SEC championship and you get a bed, bid to the college football playoff. That is a, a reality for this LSU football team. That is, I'm not going to say more likely than not, but that's the potential that this team has. When you're coming into Brian Kelly's second year with more continuity, with more, I guess, fewer questions, more answers than you have questions. I mean, this isn't a perfect team. This is still a team that has, you know, depth concerns. This is still a team that may have position groups that we are not quite entirely sold on yet, whether that be the offensive line and how that unit shapes up to be, whether it be the secondary or the cornerback position and how this defense can come together with so many pieces coming in via the transfer portal. I mean, this team's not perfect now, but this team, same head coach, same offensive coordinator, same defensive coordinator, same starting quarterback, bringing back your leading receiver, bringing back your five leading rushers from this past season. You're returning your best defensive player in Harold Perkins, and you will also get back one of your other best defensive players in Mason Smith, who's returning from injury. There is just so much that could shape up to be right for this team. So I don't know how you can't see the ceiling not be the college football playoff. Now, I don't know if that means championship necessarily. Reach for the stars. Sure, why not? But when you're talking ceiling and floor, best case scenario and worst case scenario, with it, with the the undertone of realistic expectations, I think it's spot on that it's college football playoff. Why not LSU? Coming up next, I want to get into what ESPN thinks is possibly the worst case scenario for LSU. It's not fun to hear, but let's talk through it. And we will get into that coming up next. First, I want to tell you about eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure that every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time that you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure that every part that you need fits just right and the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know that your part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Well, thanks again for making Locked in LSU your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up on Monday's edition of the podcast, we'll have a full breakdown of what we saw in the the Tiger scrimmage on Tiger Stadium on Saturday. So make sure to check that out on your preferred podcast platform and on YouTube as well. So ESPN.com put down a, a full breakdown of best case scenario, worst case scenario for each team in the top 25. Best case scenario for LSU, college football playoff semifinal. I think that that is a fair evaluation. 
a bid to the CFP, I think is like if you told me that today, like that that that's how the season is going to end up is you make it to the CFP, maybe get knocked in the semifinal. Like I can live with that, and I think that you should too. But let's get a little dose of maybe the worst case scenario. It's not fun to hear, nor is it fun for me to read. But let's break it down. And let's break down how likely that really is. Worst case scenario. Eight and five. Ugh, it tastes like vinegar even just coming out of my mouth. Eight and five with losses to Florida State, Ole Miss, ugh, Alabama, Texas A&M, and the bowl opponent. So eight and four in the regular season and a loss in the postseason. Uh, Chris Lowe writes this breakdown for LSU. Chris Lowe, of course, of ESPN. Um, says the Tigers finished 10-4 and four last season, and that was with losses in two of their three final games, which is true. But, you know, before I go on to, to really break down what Chris Lowe had to say there, that's true. LSU did win two of their final three games, but I think the way that that's worded it maybe doesn't provide enough context because two of those final three games, well, one of those games was the SEC championship against Georgia. The other one of those games was just an epic meltdown and breakdown at Texas A&M. That was a game that LSU really had no business losing. And then, of course, that final game of the season, just an absolute blowout against Purdue. So when you break it down, like a, a game that you lost that you weren't supposed to lose because you were banged up and Texas A&M approached that game like it was their national championship because it was, and that you just weren't prepared enough for that game, that A&M's run game popped off against LSU's defense better than they popped off against any other defense they had seen that season. It's not excuse making for LSU. I mean, they should have won that game and they didn't. They absolutely just peed the bed that game. Um, so I'll, I'll give you that one, but then a loss against Georgia, the eventual national champions, the back-to-back national champions, the best team in the country consensus. I, I can't hold that against this team. They hung more points on Georgia in that game than any other team on Georgia's regular season schedule. So yeah, it was a loss and yeah, you don't want to see any team lose a game, especially on that, on a stage of that caliber, but still a little context there would be appreciated. And then of course, just to a beat down of epic proportions against Purdue. So it's true, but also context justifies it a bit. But I'll continue. Winning just eight games as an encore to what LSU did a year ago would be a disappointment. I would agree. But there aren't a lot of easy outs on LSU's schedule, and the September slate is filled with potholes. Getting Alabama and Tuscaloosa this season automatically makes it a more difficult schedule. And four of the first six games are away from Tiger Stadium. LSU's talent level is such that there shouldn't be a significant drop-off, but making it back to the SEC championship game will prove difficult. I would agree. Of course it's going to be hard to make it to the SEC championship game. It's always difficult to make it back to the SEC championship game. I mean, you could go 11-1 and and miss out on the SEC championship game. Like, that, like, that's how difficult it is. LSU could beat every team on their schedule except Alabama, and they wouldn't go to Atlanta, maybe, depending on what Alabama does on their side. So, like, yeah, it's always going to be hard to make it back to the SEC championship game. But allow me to be the biggest LSU homer and fan in the world here and say that looking at the best and worst case scenarios for this team, I think it's far more likely that LSU lean towards leans towards the best case scenario rather than the worst case scenario. Because looking at these proposed losses, I don't see a loss at Ole Miss. I really don't. And maybe that's me overvaluing this LSU football team and maybe undervaluing Ole Miss and what Lane Kiffin has done. I just don't, I don't see a loss there. And if it is a loss there, I don't see Texas A&M also being a loss. I look at those two games and I would say that the most realistic possibility is that you split them if you drop one at all. Because again, reminder, you get Texas A&M at home. And I don't have it up in front of me, but I don't believe that the home team has lost a, the game, again, the, the matchup between Texas A&M and LSU, which is just wild that it has been such a back and forth and competitive little rivalry. 
But having that game at home, I think, is huge. And yes, of course, Texas A&M absolutely could have figured things out by the final game of the season. And all of these offensive question marks that we have around Texas A&M of, you know, is Connor Wegman the guy who's going to be calling plays? Is Jimbo Fisher really willing to take his foot off the gas and, you know, hand the keys over to Bobby Petrino? Those are all questions that we're going to have answers to come late November. But I don't see losses to both of those teams. I just, I really don't. I think this LSU team is too good and too stacked to drop both of those games. I would say the most realistic possibility between the best case and the worst case scenario. Like if I had to put money on it today, I would say it's probably 10 and 2. With perhaps a loss to Florida State and Alabama. Or maybe it's weird, fluky losses to, you know, Ole Miss and A&M. Maybe it's a loss to Florida State early in the season and then a weird, fluky loss to A&M late in the season because maybe you're banged up and Texas A&M isn't. I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I would say if, if I'm going to say 10-2, and two, I would say the most realistic losses come against Florida State and Alabama. I think those are the two biggest challenges on LSU schedule, but 10 and two, it's not something to scoff at 10 and two might not get you to the call, uh, excuse me, to the SEC championship, but it might because I don't see Alabama going 11 and one or undefeated. I mean, Alabama may have losses to Texas. Alabama may skid against Texas A&M. Let's not forget that a, a much more stacked Alabama team and a much more, you know, green and young Texas A&M team this past season, it came down to the wire. I mean, Alabama almost lost that game. So it's not lost on me that that Alabama could have two, maybe even three losses at the end of the season, which could give you a bid to to Atlanta. But 10 and two, I'm good with. That's an improvement from this last season. 10 and two could get you to Atlanta. It might not, but even if it doesn't, I don't think we can view that as a step back for this program. Because let me remind you something that I always try and remind college football fans, LSU fans, whoever it may be. Success is not linear in this league. Just because you beat Alabama last year doesn't mean you're guaranteed to beat Alabama this year. Just because you beat Ole Miss last year doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to beat Ole Miss this year. Now, comparing both of the teams, I like my money on LSU. But success isn't linear. So even if you don't make it back to Atlanta, that doesn't mean that the season was a failure. Because a 10-2 and two season is better than what you had last season when you went 9-3 and three in the regular season. So we're looking at best case and worst case scenario. I lean toward the best case scenario, that that's probably more likely. But even if it's not, that doesn't make this season a disappointment. Now, if you go 8-4, and four, now that's a disappointment. And that's a completely different story. But again, I, don't, I just don't see this schedule shaking out that way. Not just with LSU's opponents, but also with the way that the, the schedule falls. Go back to last season. And there was a, a, a portion of LSU's schedule this past season that was just an absolute gauntlet. That I stared at that month and I thought, I don't know how you're going to make it out of this alive. Because the stretch was Auburn, Tennessee, Florida, Ole Miss, and Alabama. I mean, that's, that's a tough stretch now. And then also add on top of that a road trip to Arkansas in November when it's cold. And then you got at least a little bit of a gimme there in UAB, and then you had Texas A&M. That was a tough, tough stretch. LSU's schedule, the way it's laid out this year, I think it's it's spread out, and those tough games are kind of cherry-picked in the middle of the season because you've got Florida State, which is going to be a tough test. Then you've got three games, three winnable games against Grambling, Mississippi State, and then you host Arkansas at home all three winnable. Then you go on the road at, at Ole Miss. That's a game that I think LSU should be favored by at least a touchdown. And then you've got Missouri host Auburn host army. Those should all be winnable games. Now Auburn's not going to be the easiest game to win. Not with what Hugh freeze, I think is going to be able to do at Auburn this season army and the, you know, the, the service academies are never easy games to win, but they're all winnable games. And you've got a tough game at Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and then you finish the season with three winnable games against Florida. You're hosting Florida, hosting Georgia State, and then you host Texas A&M. You know, the toughest games on your schedule, 
They're not all clumped together. You've got a gimme here and there. And I think that bodes well in LSU's favor. Coming up next, LSU has a scrimmage in Tiger Stadium tomorrow. What I'm going to be looking for, we'll get into that on the other side. Well, thanks again for making Locked in LSU your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And also, we've been doing you know, conference previews throughout the, the podcast network. So those will be available on this podcast feed and on podcast feeds across the Locked On Network. You can also find it on LockedOnPodcast.com. We've got a brand new renovated website. It looks great. All of the people at the Locked On Network have done a wonderful and fabulous job with that. So you can find that. That coming up over uh, in the next couple of days. But I want to get into the scrimmage because LSU takes the field at Tiger Stadium tomorrow on Saturday afternoon. A couple things that I'm going to be watching. Obviously, number one is the quarterbacks. And it's not just which quarterback looks better between Jaden Daniels and Garrett Nussmeyer, but I'm going to be looking at both of them individually. It's less of a comparison because we know who's going to be the starting quarterback. I mean, even if Garrett Nussmeyer goes out there and absolutely balls out, I think that Jaden Daniels, I know Jaden Daniels will still be the starter against Florida State. I want to look at each of them as individuals. How does Jaden Daniels run this offense? How is Jaden Daniels' ability to sit back in the pocket and grow, go through his progressions and use his arm as much of a weapon as he uses his legs? Is he able to sit back and be a little bit more patient than we saw him this time last year? I'm be looking at that. I'm going to be looking at Jaden Daniels' ability to spread the ball around. Um, I want to see Jaden Daniels target Malik Neighbors because we know that that, that – connection is going to be lethal. But I also want to see how Jaden Daniels gets the tight ends involved in the passing game. How does Jaden Daniels get the running backs involved in the passing game? And who emerges as a trustworthy target in the rest of this wide receiver room? We know that Malik Neighbors is a trustworthy target. But is Jaden Daniels leaning toward Kyron Lacey? Is Jaden Daniels leaning toward a Brian Thomas? Is Aaron Anderson, Alabama transfer, going to be involved heavily into the passing game and with which team, first or second team? So I'm intrigued to see that. And then also with Garrett Nussmeyer, how are we seeing his ball control and his touch? That's something that Garrett Nussmeyer has needed to work on. He's always had this reputation as a gunslinger, uh, rightfully so, and it's not a bad thing. Uh, and that's one of his strengths and also one of his greatest weaknesses is his ability to just let it rip because when you let it rip sometimes magical things happen but also when you let it rip on the other side it leads to turnovers it can lead to irresponsible ball control so how are we seeing Garrett Nussmeyer's command of the offense touch on his balls um lol oops touch on his passes um yeah that's what I'm looking from for the quarterbacks also what I'm Looking for the running backs. How does Mike Denbrock use the running backs? Now, again, this is not going to be like a full four-quarter, you know, 30, 35 pass attempt game. This is going to be less than 100 snaps. Um, but how are the running backs getting involved? Which running back comes in in which situation? Which running back is used more maybe catching passes out of the backfield? Is there going to be that certified go-to running back on first down or on third down? I'm going to be intrigued to see that because as we discussed in the podcast yesterday, which of course you can find on your preferred podcast platform and on the YouTube page, um, it, I, this running back room is incredibly deep. You've got eight backs in this room, six of which have valuable starting experience at the power five level, whether that's at LSU, like a Josh Williams or a Noah Kane or an Armani Goodwin, but also like a Logan Diggs who transferred in from Notre Dame and had over a thousand yards rushing and receiving combined last year. So I'm going to be intrigued to see that. Um, and then finally, how does this offensive line hold up against the defensive line? They're not going to be able to get to the quarterback. They're not going to you know, kind of take the quarterback down to the ground in the scrimmage. But how is this offensive line able to hold its own? I believe that this is going to be one of the best defensive fronts in the SEC this season. You're bringing back Mason Taylor in in conjunction with um, Ovia Gufo, with Makai Wingo, 
you know, who's at that Jack linebacker position? Is it Ovia Gufo? Is it Braden Swinson in conjunction with Harold Perkins? I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this O-line and D-line go up against one another. So I'll be focusing on uh, some of the battles in the trenches there. So it should be fun. I'm excited. I think we may get a few more answers to some questions that we may have. And how do we feel coming out of the scrimmage on, on Saturday? Are we more encouraged? Are we less encouraged? Do we feel about the same as our confidence level varied or differed on Sunday than it does today. We'll get into all of that uh, on Monday's edition of Locked in LSU, but that's going to do it for me today. Thank you for making Locked in LSU your first listen every single day. Full scrimmage breakdown on Monday's edition of Locked in LSU.